I should double check the sound, but I think get my elevator so I can see myself. All right, I think we're all set. It looks like we're going. All right, we have some good work to do today. Um, we always have some good work to do, right? But this, today especially, I might have you bookmark a page if you have a bookmark or something available so we can move around. I might even have you bookmark two spots. We could just do some work that hopefully um, doesn't overwhelm us too much. Maybe I should have erased this before. But let's do some things. Our goal is to look at Revelation 17. And um, before we get there, we kind of want to um, do a data dump, you could say, and make some connections from other scriptures that will really help us out as we read chapter 17. I really got to work hard. To... <laughs> this is my rotator cuff exercise. <laughs> it dries out, I think. It's the dry air that makes me work to get this clean. Okay, so a couple of scriptures. Revelation 17 is our target. And uh, we'll maybe we'll open with prayer here, and we're going to look at two other spots. And so Jeremiah 50, that'd be one to open up to and bookmark. And I think I might try to squeeze in. I've, I've always really, it's such a great chapter to know about, is Ezekiel 16. I'd like to do both of those. And I'll try to take some notes. So let's see. I'll, I'll, let's see. I'll do Jeremiah 50 to 51. They're really long. We have Ezekiel 16. One of these days, I'm going to do a study. I'm going to buy a bunch of black dry erase markers from different companies and do a test, see which ones I like the best. So Jeremiah 50, I tried to scribble them up here. Jeremiah 50 and 51 and Ezekiel 16. Oh, is Ezekiel 16. Yeah, you know, sorry to sorry to give you all the stuff to do, but I think this will really help. I think I think it'll help in a variety of ways. What is this? It's sort of like an opportunity to um when you read a book, you gain the language of the author and the book. God's giving us a language for spiritual topics that you can't see, right? God gives you a language through the Bible. And Revelation has always been, I think I think you've noticed this, has always been a book that reaches back and borrows and grabs and uses metaphors and illustrations and events and places from and prophecies, right? Pictures from the Old Testament, and it brings them along and it's using it. So it's, it's a great finish to the Bible because there's so much of a summarizing in the sense that happens with Revelation. Where you, you grab all of this, you're kind of putting it all together. And so what we're going to do is we're going to reach back and we're going to look and we're going to keep put something fresh on the mind for that Bible language, our common speech from God's word before we read through Revelation 17. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, let's begin with prayer and then Jeremiah 50, okay? Heavenly Father, in your view of all things, you have worked it and planned it and set it up and created and brought to fulfillment your words. From beginning to end, in view of all things, your words have always told us the story. And we ask that you continue to deepen our understanding, not just for knowledge sake, but for the comfort that you seek to bring to our hearts in the midst of what we recognize as a troubled, evil and sin consequence kind of world. Be that light for us in the darkness that we would hold hold to your way and your truth throughout our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Great. These chapters are so long. 
<laughs> Jeremiah is just like if you're going to read a chapter a day, you give yourself a day and a half for Jeremiah chapters. Just kidding. They're just they are long. They're poetic. They're beautiful. Somewhat repetitious, um, but they get long. What I'd like to do for the Jeremiah one is I'd like to be the reader. And I just want you to think about some of the different, if you were to condense it and make a long chapter short, say, here's, here's some bullet points of some spiritual comments being made from the Lord through Jeremiah. What are those bullet points? And I'll try to make them on the board. Does that sound good? That's our goal. Try to distill this a little bit. So let's start 50 verse 1. This is the word the Lord spoke through Jeremiah the prophet concerning Babylon and the land of the Babylonians. Announce and proclaim among the nations. Lift up a banner and proclaim it. Keep nothing back but stay. Babylon will be captured. Bel will be put to shame. Marduk filled with terror. Those are the names of their false gods. Her images will be put to shame and her idols filled with terror. There you go. Parallelism. A nation from the north will attack her and lay waste her land. No one will live in it. Both men and animals will flee away. In those days at that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah together will go in tears to seek the Lord their God. They will ask the way to Zion and turn their faces toward it. They will come and bind themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray and caused them to roam in the mountains. They wandered over mountain and hill and forgot their own resting place. Whoever found them devoured them. Their enemies said, we are not guilty for they sinned against the Lord, their true pasture the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Flee out of Babylon, leave the land of the Babylonians and be like the goats that lead the flock. For I will stir up and bring against Babylon an alliance of great nations from the land of the north. They will take up their positions against her and from the north she will be captured. Their arrows will be like skilled warriors who do not return empty handed. So Babylonia will be plundered, all who plunder her will have their fill, declares the Lord. I'm going to need to pause, right? Just because there's so much. Yeah. Um, but bullet points that you've noticed already? Bullet points of just a general truth of what God is saying to his people so far. We repeated the, the Babylon in this. Twice. What about it? Babylon will, what does God want to say? It will fall. Babylon will fall. Absolutely. That's huge. Babylon will fall. What else? Their, uh, their idols will be uh, put to shame. Idols put to shame. Everything connected with them. You started that way with this first section, and then we ended it with the plunder. And they're going to plunder. They're going to have their fill when they plunder Babylon, right? What else did we have in between? Summary points. A comma. A comma. Leave <laughs> the land. Okay. You had this call to the people of God to, to repent and seek the face of the Lord. So there's sort of, there's a call, I would say a call to the capital C church. A call to the capital C church to put their hope, turn their faces, and put their trust in God. But there's also a recognition of what? What reality with the sheep language? What is God that saying? They have it? been lost. They've been lost. My people have been lost. These nations think, well, they abandoned their God, and God's the God, their God is using us to punish them. So we're doing a good thing. You know, they kind of have this arrogance about them, but you know, my people have been lost. Um, lost. I'll just capitalize that as a, this is the way it's been. There's a story very clear about Israel's idolatry 
as a reason for the Lord allowing these nations to take them out of the promised land, to work repentance and to say, your shepherds, your spiritual teachers, your leaders that are supposed to be taking you to the Lord have been help causing your wandering. And now these nations are involved in scattering the flock. God wants to re um, demonstrate his grace and his love and power and bringing them back as he uses the nations, bringing them back to be a true, a true people that are his. So those three things I think are, the, are big so far. Diane? I have a note here that this was prophesied before the fall of Jerusalem. Right. So even before Jerusalem was taken away to Babylon, he's predicting the fall of Babylon. Yeah, exactly. And Jeremiah is prophesying this fall that's coming, and he's going to say to people, um, pack your bags. Don't fight and resist the Babylonians. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> We're going to be uh, jumping and jiving up here. <laughs> Thanks, Tasha. Um, but yeah, he's saying, pack your bags and go. This is the Lord's plan. You don't resist what God is trying to do in your hearts by saying we're going to take up arms and we'll stop negative. He's like, no. And then when he get to Babylon, he says, build a house, get cozy, get comfortable and pray for the people that are there that you're with. Right. So Jeremiah does in advance say all of these things, um, but he doesn't want you to see, even as other people are in power, he doesn't want the church to ever think that god is really gone or that god is now weak because someone else is winning no scripture story is always to say god is using the nations for spiritual good god is using things god is not intimidated by a nebuchadnezzar god is not afraid by the boogeyman either and you have a powerful strong god that presents his word and things go by my word and i'm going to use them for this because this was true and i'm i'm do, i'm actually a god who shepherds and i'm going to do something about my lost sheep that they would hear my call and i don't want you to think too much of babylon they're going to fall don't listen to their arrogant words and as if bell and marduk are something we're more powerful than your lord eh, whatever that's baloney they're gonna fall and i'm gonna show it to you I, this may be really kind of dumb, but I um, I don't understand why uh, they go to Babylon. Uh, well, I, I, I because their land is being uh, yeah. destroyed. Yeah. But then why why Babylon is is also destroyed? Mm. Um, and they're I suppose going back to Zion or to um mm -hmm. where they originally came from maybe yeah um i don't know it's a little confusing to me when yeah I was reading that mm -hmm. well, i think babylon to be destroyed is a statement from god to say earthly powers have this way of treating themselves as deities and gods and saying with our power and our gods we're untouchable in fact, mm -hmm. you're going to read that language in the next chapter where God confronts their arrogance. And the true God does, right? And he's going to say, you think you're everything, like the king of the mountain. There's only one mountain and there's only one king, and it's me. And I'll show you. I'll show you. There's going to be a Cyrus the Great that comes, said Isaiah, right? Um, so there, God's prophet said, said things way ahead of time to announce so that people could follow along and say, whoa, you really are king of kings and lord of lords. Look at what you do with the nations. And all peoples then have no excuse on judgment day. Whether you lived in Babylon or grew up there, you still could say there was a lord who made his reputation known in world history. And um, that, that was our opportunity to hear the word of God. And to say, ask those Jews, who is this lord? you guys talk about he sure is uh he sure says a lot <laughs> suzanne since we're time oriented what was the timeline of when the um uh, 
exodus was completed in Babylon, and then how long were the Israelites in Babylon before Babylon fell? Yeah, that, that's the whole 70 year period. 70 years and this is where some of the prophecies in the book of Daniel, you remember that crazy statue that has like a, you know, a head of this and a chest of that, and you've got iron and gold and silver and bronze and clay or something like that. You know, you've got these different eras and he's talking about these world powers that will come one after another we have the same thing in revelation 17 when we get there uh, the, the reference to five five rulers who have fallen and and um what kind of how we already have our our numbering started with who comes next so the babylonian empire the the full captivity expression of captivity there's something in 605 a.d of a parse or bc <laughs> um, um, 605 BC of a an early deportation or bringing of some captives out of the land of Judah, but the I'll put that in parentheses. The big one was 586, right? The fall of Jerusalem, and then all the way to about 516. That's your period of 70 years when um, the Babylonian Empire crumbled. <laughs> So then the the fourth, the kind of the next big empire with uh, the Medes and the Persians, but I'm gonna focus, we'll focus on the Persians today. And then um, after them, you have the Greeks, Alexander the Great and things like that. And and you know who comes after the Greeks? The Rome, Roman Empire, yeah. So so that's your timeline. Assyrians, Assyrians were just before this, right? The Assyrians were in power um, think of Sennacherib and Hezekiah and some of those. There's a whole historical section in Isaiah, right, where he's talking about Sennacherib's attack on Jerusalem to try to take it down. Um, and then Sennacherib was a military commander at the time, and he became the king of Assyria for like 60 years. So the fall of Jer fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians happened in 722 BC. These were the dates that you just like lock in mm -hmm. your memory for Assyrian fall of the northern kingdom and this fall of the southern kingdom of Jerusalem in 586. 722 and 586. There'll be a quiz on that later with extra smarties. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Extra smarties if you can get it right. I got two, two backups. Hey, I was going to ask you something yeah. though, that we kind of skipped over. So I'll just read this quickly. Uh, they will come and bind themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant yeah. that will not be forgotten. Yeah. You remember like Jeremiah 34? Is that rich covenant? language i'll make a new covenant with them one that will last forever that's all jesus it's all talking about the new testament church right. that that in christ will have this bond um and think of that that language the separation of lost sheep and then this bond language of the church we are the body of christ this beautiful new testament bride bride and bridegroom all that neat stuff coming together let's keep going let's keep going um jeremiah 50 11. because you rejoice and are glad you who pillage my inheritance you frolic like a heifer threshing grain and nay like stallions your mother will be greatly ashamed she who gave you birth will be disgraced she will be the least of the nations a wilderness a dry land a desert because of the lord's anger she will not be inhabited all but will be completely desolate. All who pass Babylon will be horrified and scoff because of all her wounds. This is just more language poetry for this. Take up your positions around Babylon, all you who draw the bow. So God's making this language really clear that Babylon's gonna fall. And now speaking to everybody else like, this is gonna happen. I'm gonna calling you out with your weapons and your, your arrows to draw the bow and shoot at babylon shoot at her spare no arrows for she has sinned against the lord and babylon's arrogance being their own god shout against her on every side she surrenders her towers fall her walls are torn down since this is the vengeance of the lord take vengeance on her do to her as she has done to others cut off from babylon the sower the reaper with his sickle at harvest 
Because of the sword of the oppressor, let everyone return to his own people. Let everyone flee to his own land. Israel is a scattered flock that lions have chased away. The first to devour him was the king of Assyria. The last to crush his bones was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I punish the king of Assyria. But I will bring Israel back to his own pasture and he will graze on Carmel and Bashan. His appetite will be satisfied on the hills of Ephraim and Gilead. In those days at that time, search will be made for Israel's guilt, but there'll be none. See, this is Jesus. In those days when I bring back my real people, put their trust in me, they have no sin. There will be none. And for the sins of Judah, none will be found because I'm going to forgive the remnant I spare. So there's a forgiveness. It's not that they're perfect people and they don't sin anymore. It's that they're forgiven. Um, I wonder if I should try to move there's a lot of this is just is repetitious summon archers gather against her go to verse 31 find verse 31 jeremiah 50 31 see i am against you O arrogant one declares the lord the lord almighty for your day has come the time for you to be punished the arrogant one will stumble and fall and no one will help her up i will kindle a fire in her towns that will consume all who are around her so it's a, again, everything against the Babylonians. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to look for some new points. Let's go to chapter 51. Later. Right? <laughs> Chapter 51. So it opens with a call of destruction. I want you to go to verse 4 so we can see verse 5. They will fall down slain in Babylon, fatally wounded in her streets. For Israel and Judah have not been forsaken by their God, the Lord Almighty though their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel. So every, this is the big assumption, right? Worldly thinking that if my people were a lost people, they were poorly shepherded, wandered away from me. But even despite her guilt, do not say that they're for, forsaken by their God. And when you see Babylon fall, I'm telling you who's doing it. It's me. I'm bringing in the nations. I'm giving them victory over the Babylonians, that the Babylonian Empire will cease, as you know it. So then you get verse 6. Flee from Babylon. Run for your lives. Do not be destroyed because of her sins. It's a time for the Lord's vengeance. He will pay her what she deserves. Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand. She made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, they have now gone mad. Babylon will suddenly fall and be broken. Wail over her. Get balm for her pain. Perhaps she can be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she cannot be healed. Let us leave her and each go to his own land, for her judgment reaches to the skies. It rises as high as the clouds. The Lord has vindicated us. Come, let us tell in Zion what the Lord our God has done. Just notice how incredible it is to stay the church. You're proclaiming what the Lord has done, his marvelous deeds. You're holding to a confession of faith. Look at back at verse 6. Don't be destroyed because of her sins. This is the Lord's vengeance. So it's almost like the arrogance of Babylon is like this cup. Thanks, Tasha, for the illustration. <laughs> is this cup she's passing around in her arrogance. We got this in our gods and our deities. And you come out of her. Don't be a part of this spiritual stupor and drunkenness in, in this drinking this goblet of wine. She made her, the nations drink from her the maddening wine of her adulteries, their arrogance to as they 
as they play with power in their own hands, they are assuming that they are on their own and just it's because we're stronger than you. And any nation that follows suit, making power plays in the world without submitting to the Lord of all is living the same lie. They're drinking the same drink. So you got to see the connection for all worldly powers. You get all the world that gets drunk on its power, hunger, pleasures, and, you know, prestige. It's all terrible. Um, it's this maddening cup that the world is drinking. Um, and God would have you not be destroyed. Don't be destroyed by her. Don't drink that cup. Stay true to your God as you see all this stuff take place. So we're really, I, we've kind of identified three things we keep coming back to, but I really like that, that language. You need to see the cup Babylon was, making the whole earth drunk. Look at how big you can get. Look at how much land you can take. Notice these empires were all, the Assyrian empire is kind of like this. The Babylonian Empire goes like that. Then the Greek Empire goes like this. And the Roman Empire, boy, how far did they go, right? Do you, you remember how they keep pushing? And they're just like, when are we going to stop fighting battles? And how far do we really have to go to rule? It goes like this. So, you know, they're all drunk on this concept. And the idea of expansion and territory and power and empire, you know, this instead of what used to be, you know, kind of city kings almost, mm -hmm. kings of a city, the king of Og and Bashan, you know, these like little local rulers and smaller territories. Now they, they're getting drunk on the idea we could rule all these people. Um, I forgot the, the Persians in there, but you, you can see this on maps and see how these empires built one off of another. When they conquered each other, they added their own lands in. So there's a there's a lot going on um, in those words. Um, anything else there? I don't know if I I don't know if there's there's so much that um, so repetitious. <laughs> But the picture of that cup and maddening wine, that's what you're going to hear again later. And I'm trying to see if there are others. I was trying to figure out if Babylon was ever uh, right in the sight of God. And then it went downhill from there. No, it seems to start out that way and then seem wills it way in and then oh that's more for the Israelites. The Babylonians weren't like you know loyal to God as the reason why he would use them against the Israelites. They were just a secular nation with their own gods, and they're giving credit to the wrong deities, right? But there is a call, like Nebuchadnezzar had his wake-up moment. Yeah. And David, or Daniel, and some others, right? You know, your Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stories, and you listen to the testimony that was given and in an empire like that at such a time before the kings. It's crazy. Even Sennacherib, right? What does he do before he... Um, before he falls to the Babylonians as the king of of Assyria, Sennacherib came against Jerusalem and he had thousands. Was it like 180,000 soldiers surrounding? They were as good as done. And God says, tomorrow is going to, the market's going to flip. You're all starving inside Jerusalem and it's so expensive to buy a donkey's head. And tomorrow I'm going to flip the economy so much so that you're, you're going to, everything's going to be super cheap. And the people are like, what? But what happened? God's angel went and destroyed the Assyrian army and their whole camp and all of its furnishings and supplies and food is left there. And these like, is it like shepherds or scouts are just out there and like, why is these tents just abandoned like this? 
what's that? And all the Israelites are leaving Jerusalem and they go and they plunder all this stuff. And the economy was flipped in a day, just like God said. And so don't be afraid of the Sennacherib. He had that moment to see you thought you could boast. So Isaiah touches on this. And then Second Chronicles, they're telling the story of King Hezekiah and, and what God says, don't be afraid of Sennacherib. Let me show you. Let me show you. And Sennacherib ran away with his tail between his legs um, at the word of the Lord. And Sennacherib was busy. He's like, you guys have such false hope in your Lord. I'm going to squish you like a bug tomorrow. And they have these like little taunts back and forth. And then whose word prevailed was the Lord's. How many times do we need to see it? How many times do we need to see it? We need to see it a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the last section of Jeremiah 51. Was Jeremiah living in Babylon? He would. Um, he would eventually go with the captives and write lamentations and weep with them. You know where he's at right now. Well, this is the you know this is the very end before um, Jerusalem is going to fall. So we're we're in the last era. If you look at chapter fifty-two, um, you kind of have the the last the last hurrah written out there. Even the close of 51, it says, you know, Je Jeremiah wrote on a scroll about all of this disaster. He wrote it down and he has his scribe. And then if you look the very last line of chapter 51, the words of Jeremiah end here. So chapter 52 in all the chaos gets written and it's like an appendix added on in the, in the book of Jeremiah uh, to record the fall of Jerusalem. But let's get back to spiritual, a little spiritual sense. This is Jeremiah 51, 45. Come out of her, my people, run for your lives, run from the fierce anger of the Lord. Do not lose heart or be afraid when rumors are heard in the land. One rumor comes this year, another next. Rumors of violence and of one ruler against another. For the time will surely come when I will punish the idols of Babylon. Her whole land will be disgraced and her slain will all lie fallen within her. Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon, for out of the north destroyers will attack her. So again, a spiritual call for people not to be afraid. If you hear a rumor of this or that king and all their power and what they say, God's like, my word's the only thing that sticks, should stick in your heart. Kick all these other things people give um such power and authority too right and it's such a big such a big call to the church to be the church babylon will fall all right a little peek at ezekiel 16. i wasn't sure how long all this would take but let's go we're going to turn some pages to ezekiel 16. Oh, boy. You notice the chapter heading? It's called an allegory of what? Unfaithful Jerusalem. So again, Ezekiel here is speaking the word of the Lord to look at verse 2. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. Um. Maybe to get the language, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem, verse 3. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field for on the day you were born, you were despised. This is just to say, you know, once you were not a people. You remember that New Testament language? There was a time you're not a people. But you're when you're my people, 
it's like being cared for. Can you imagine being born and nobody bothers to cut the umbilical cord? Nobody cleans off the baby. Nobody cares for the baby. As so, from when you were born as a people out of those pagan lands, you did not have someone who loved you. Then, verse 6, then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. And you who were naked and bare once before, later I passed by. I, I, right? And when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord. And you became mine. I washed you. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck, a ring in your nose, earrings on your ears, and a crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour honey and olive oil, you became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Talk about law and gospel and what God would do in picture language. And again, to make you mine and to dress you, you became like a queen. Now we go, and we go all downhill. It's, right? all metaphor. it's all metaphor. And you know it's used when Jesus talks about bride and bridegroom. Isn't that perfect? And, and how revelation is going to end there. What does God long to be in your life? Just this, I only have eyes for you kind of a thing, right? I only have eyes for you. And to think what we give our hearts to. Look at this, verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty. And you used your fame to become a prostitute. Once Israel became a planted nation, they adulterated themselves, trusting in alliances with Egypt or alliances with Assyria. Whose side, who's on my side? Who can help me out? You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. You took some of your garments to make gaudy high places where you carried on prostitution. That's a reference to idols, isn't it? high places. Such things should not happen, nor should they occur. You took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver. You made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. You took your embroidered clothes to put on them. You offered my oil and incense before them. Also the food I provided for you, the flour, olive oil, and honey I gave you to eat. You offered as fragrant incense before them. That is what happened, declares the Lord. You took your sons and daughters that you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to idols. And was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to idols. And all your detestable practices and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, kicking about in your blood. They should have been humble. They should have recognized God's grace and goodness to them throughout, just like we would in our lives. Woe, woe to you, right? Um, skip ahead to verse 32. Um, they have this increase as a prostitute and promiscuity. And verse 32, you adulterous wife, you prefer strangers to your own husband. Every prostitute receives a fee, but you give yourself away. You give gifts to your lovers, bribing them to come to you from everywhere. How backwards is that? So in your prostitution, you are the opposite of others. No one runs after you for your favors. You're the very opposite. You give payment. You're running after being a prostitute and none is given to you. So hear the word of the Lord. Because you poured out your wealth and exposed your nakedness and your promiscuity with your lovers, because of all your detestable idols, because you gave them your children's blood, I'm gonna gather all your lovers whom you found pleasure with whom you found pleasure, those you loved, as well as those you hated. I'm gonna gather them all against you from all around and will strip you in front of them and they'll see all your nakedness. 
I'll sentence you to the punishment of women who commit adultery and shed blood. I'll bring upon you the blood vengeance of my wrath and jealous anger. Then I will hand you over to your lovers and they will tear down your mounds and destroy your lofty shrines. They'll strip you of your clothes and take your fine jewelry and leave you naked and bare. I'm just going to pause there. You can, you can keep going, but notice how God calls them out for their unfaithfulness and promises this, promises to take them away as a call to repentance and judgment on the unbelieving, a call to repentance of the people, um, that they would be his. But isn't that just the most poetic way to describe the big picture through Ezekiel? It's like from having everything to nothing. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Yeah. And the reality is anytime our hearts are with our wallets or our health or something that's not the Lord, the emptiness of process, it's such a fool's gold. And how does he show it as a fool's gold? By taking it all away and say, look what you put your trust in that you really can't hold on to and takes it all away. And now there's what is left, what is left, turn to me and be saved. I would not have you die and perish forever, but everyone turn to me and live. This is the kind of God I would want to be with you. That is the very same judgment that is exacted in Revelation 17 and described. We still have about 35 minutes left. So if you don't mind, with such a setting, we and a backdrop of language, you can now read in a totally fresh way something like Revelation 17. So can we do that together? Let's go to Revelation 17 and continue our study. There's, I know that there's other places um, that we could refresh to pull so much together from, for Revelation, but If you remember, we ended chapter 16 with um, it is done and a judgment of look at like verse 19 as you wanted a, re a reminder. The great city was split into three parts. The cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. She so have the completeness, a complete expression of God's judgment. Now we're going to revisit it. I point that out because we're kind of revisiting in another vision, this fall of this Babylon um, that we have. So let's see what the an angel wants to show us. One of these seven angels, we're kind of keeping this as related material to the seven angels with the seven bowls. So somebody read verses one and two of chapter 17. We don't have Joanne to be our lead off here today. Suzanne, you're sitting close to her spot. You probably need to read verses one and two. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Okay. So if my lost people are like a prostitute, um, or one worse than a prostitute, one, one who's broken and been unfaithful to a marriage, um, I don't want to say worse, they're both bad, but you, this one involves the context, right, of a marriage with the Lord. So we're using the language of prostitute, but we're also mixing in the ad word adultery. Um, with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery. That means she's supposed to be married to another. This language is also describing for us this greatness of Babylon as an enemy of the real church is an apostate church. Apostate church means it stands off, that the church is supposed to be here and do this, 
And in the apostate church, it's like a rebellious church that has the false stuff we've been talking about, false doctrine. Has, it doesn't proclaim what God would have it proclaim. It doesn't exist as God would have it exist. It's separate and it's cut off. It's adulterous with the kings of the earth. It's going after the wrong things. It's object, it's mission, it's purpose, it's message, message. It's all off. It's all apart, standing apostate, standing apart from the mission, the message that God has given to his church, what he's called you to be. So that's what we have in this language of this adulterous prostitute. My people are like this. My people are like, my own people can be like this. Um, and their waywardness. <laughs> With her, they committed adultery. The inhabitant, so there's a trickle down effect. Out of the apostate church, you have this adultery with the kings of this world, this kind of alliance. And then you have this intoxication across the inhabitants of the world. The world is worse off for it. When the church fails to be the church, the world is the worse off for it. It's like losing your flashlight that you need in the cave. Suzanne? Sits on many waters. Is that the filtering down throughout the whole earth? Yes. We're gonna we're gonna talk about he's gonna we're gonna get an explanation of the waters. Uh where does that come? The one who sits on many waters. Um middle of two. Oh, verse 15. The angel's gonna say, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And I think that's striking because we've had these four things to talk about the church in Revelation, right? We have these four corners, the church mm -hmm. spreading out and, and multitudes gathered around the throne, worshiping God, multitudes, languages, peoples, and tongues. There they were gathered around the throne in worship. So what's happened in this church is you also have multitudes deceived multitudes um i think the commentary here by siegbert becker he's he said you shouldn't don't be conned just because a church is big doesn't mean it's good just because it's a mega church doesn't mean it's on message it very well may be off with its own multitudes and languages and peoples and tribes and nations right and, and it could be off so there's a call to us that, to watch out for this prostitute, adulterous church um, with its multitudes of followers. There, there was a guy on, on TV this morning I was watching, and he talked about this very thing. He said, the outside world wants to destroy the church, but they know that attacking it from the outside is not going to work. So they're planting people in the church to adulterate the word and destroy the church from the inside. Yeah. And in history, we didn't even need that kind of help to make a mess of the church. <laughs> right? There are false teachers within the church that arose that didn't have to come from without. But I think that's what you kind of have a these three players, right? The people in the church that are supposed to be the church, but they're not. And then this alliance with governments or civil government, you could say it's the Civil government is an institution of God, but it can, there's a there are negative sides to s abuses and um, I guess you could say sinful things that can happen right in civil government. We can say so we're not. It's not like we're going to say, "Oh, civil government, get rid of you." We don't want civil government at all. We recognize there's authorities that have been established by God, and there's ways to respect and to appreciate and pray for our July 4th. We can say things right about government and we ask God for his blessing and how he uses government and our leaders. We do this almost every single Sunday, but there's also abuses that happen and you're seeing this blend of people in the church wanting to keep their control and trying to use government for doing that or using laws for the way they want to they want to punish who they want to punish and they want to preserve and protect who they want to protect but it's not in the gospel it's with things when evolutionary teaching was kind of up for grabs in the country 
um, he tells a story about, you know, some liberal church members in Arkansas who didn't want the creator expressed in public school. Well, there's this weird thing about how you make laws in the world and how the church might support certain laws or another one, even people inside a church that's not true to the word of God, right? It's It stays apostate. And that's that's what you're seeing there. And then the third then is is the impact on, on the in the world, the multitudes, the peoples, the nations, you know, the, the third party in that, the overflow of it. So she sits on the waters and she uses the government to keep her sitting position and her control as a voice and power play over the many waters, right? Um, there's a lot of examples in history that fit this. A lot of examples, Middle Ages, and uh, you mm -hmm. think of city states and some of the, or, yeah, um, church church state relationships um, that were more common in Europe and things like that. There's just a lot of this um, blend, and why the Bible always brings it up is because the church loses, not the souls lose when the gospel isn't proclaimed, and you. Mm -hmm. This is why you have to be careful how you function as a church in the world. That what is our church that we want our pastor to preach on all these uh, things we would vote for or whatever. No, you don't. You want your pastor to preach the gospel and stay on message. We are citizens in the country, but uh, but if the church becomes something that's engrossed in like, we need these laws and we need this, and your pastor is the one saying, we have to vote this way and we have to vote this way, then now we have abused we have a, we're lost our mission and our message. I think if you preach the gospel, if you preach the, the word, it gives you a way of looking at what they want to propose as laws. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be told how to vote. You will know if it's against God. Yeah. You know, you know you're not going to vote for that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. We have these three. So I'm glad you asked about the waters because we are we're kind of fleshing out an interpretation. And John doesn't want to leave you hanging. Or the you know the the angel doesn't the angel's teaching right the angel's mm -hmm. teaching i want to tell you about those waters these are the waters she's sitting on so that's good i'm going to show you that i and what is how is this framed i'm not just going to show you the prostitute i'm going to show you the punishment i could write this this is a really big word isn't it i'm going to show you the punishment you people of god you need to know however crazy it gets in Christendom or in anti-Christian forces within the church and without, I'm showing you the punishment. Sorry to make such a mess. <laughs> I'm showing, this is the theme, isn't it? I'm showing you the punishment of these forces. In chapter 18, we're kind of getting our picture cast first, and then chapter 18 is going to show you the, uh, the, the wrath and the punishment expressed. So let's go with the spirit into the desert, verse three through three through three through five, three through five. A reader for that. Three through five. Go ahead, Donna. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. Okay. Wonderful. First, we go into a desert. The angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. This is the second desert we've had in Revelation. Um, do you remember chapter 12? That the, the woman who escaped the dragon went to a safe place prepared for her by God to be safe in the desert and with that woman was the church now we go to a desert we see the church 
on drugs, quote unquote. We see the church adulterous. So we're we're again invited to see kind of the, this mess out there, especially under the dragon, right? With Satan's um, Satan's lies at work, and you see the woman with the beast. Now we had verse two, a prostitute, and with her were the kings of the earth. Now you have this church, this prostitute church sitting on a scarlet beast covered with blasphemous names with seven heads and ten horns and that's not new information that's also chapter 13 right so out in the desert kind of with the woman again but the woman is very messed up this time and the beast that came out of the sea chapter 13 verse 1 with seven heads and ten horns he's still around and we've had this in intermittent chapters too this beast um, hasn't disappeared ever since we kind of had this second section um, from chapter 12, 13. So blasphemous names, and she's sitting there, and notice the colors. Scarlet beast, and the woman is dressed in purple and scarlet. Think of like being a, a fan of a team. Mm -hmm. You know, you you go and you've watched the game and you dress in the colors, you dress in a jersey, you you got that stuff to show support for your team. She's got the same colors. She's wearing the scarlet of the beast, right? Um so I saw a woman sitting on the beast and they're sharing team colors together. Mm -hmm. And she's got all her oh, well, she can flaunt her jewelry and her precious stones and gold, the gold cup, right? Golden cup in her hand, filled with all these abominable things, these things that don't belong to the people of God, that don't belong to God's word. It's the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great. So that's also not new, Babylon the Great. Mother of prostitutes and all the abominations of the earth. When you think of Genesis and the fall into sin and what the devil wanted to accomplish in the garden, right, was a great separation of Adam and Eve from their Lord defiance of the word of God that came from the devil's mouth. That's what makes the worst of all abominations is when someone doesn't teach you about God correctly, but comes up with lies or denials of his word that would take you away from your allegiance to him. This is the worst thing you could do to a life because you're destroying a soul. When you destroy someone's relationship with God, you're destroying their eternity. You're destroying their soul. So to call this Babylon the Great and the mother of all is sort of like going back to the garden, seeing the mother of all lies. You will not surely die. You just went against the word of God. That is the chief of lies to do that. So anything that would directly contradict. So if the Catholic Church says in the Council of Trent, if anyone teaches that by grace alone and through Jesus alone, you have the forgiveness of sins. Let them be anathema. Let them be condemned. You've got a, a mother of lies sitting there, right? It's, it's an example, among others, of going against the rock-solid truth of the word in a way that then is going to divorce someone from that word, um, which is the worst thing you could do. What an abomination. So there you have the clarity of these terms. And the, the Apostle Paul used the word mystery with an antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, this, this, so it's not necessarily a new word to say mystery. The mystery is like this secret that the worst thing you could think of would come out of the church. Who knew that the worst thing, that the source of all this stuff would be false doctrine about God. I just sort of went ahead and said stuff. <laughs> yeah, you do. It's okay. <laughs> 
Well, you know what? Um, let's read a little more because we get, we see this now and, and verse six concludes it. And then we're going to get explanation. We can kind of revisit some things. Okay. Um, verse six, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw, well, I guess we, well, I guess we'll come back to that again. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven head and 10 horns. And he starts with the beast. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb. But the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Oh, that was a lot. That's a lot, but we kind of, we stuck with our characters that were introduced and we kind of see some connected teaching to each part of what was introduced to us in the first half, the first six verses. Um, it, in the beginning, the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints. Yeah. And the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Yep. So, I don't know. I, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. I mean, how to understand that. Yeah. Um, I think you have, an, you have an alliance, right? An apostate church woman who is called at the very end, the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And at that time, mm -hmm. that must have been Rome. It must have been Rome at that time. It doesn't mean that we're, we're stuck in interpreting this only as Rome, but it definitely stood for Rome at that time as this confluence of um, religious and political power, right? Mm -hmm. And a, an apostate church to be, to you should be looking for something out of Rome as an apostate church and a problem. And that woman with the government state power on its side, mm -hmm. um, which certainly happened a lot in history, put to death people um think of like burning at the stake or something mm -hmm. someone who would speak against the church having using the government what do the religious leaders even do with jesus right they go to Pilate. we don't have authority to put to death you put this one to death we want to put jesus to death right now you kind of have the same thing where church authority leaders in connection with civil government power are able to put people to death and their persecution and death that they bring to, to true believers or Christians um, and their testimony about Jesus in this world snuffed, snuffed out. Cheer to look for this. 
I, I think you can easily see a connection to um, an identi identification of the papacy as the Antichrist, but don't have to be stuck limiting it to that because there are other examples and other places where the same alliance has happened at the expense of believers that live there, the blood of believers. Merlin's brewing a thought. Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's a lot of symbolism, but you just have to try to figure it out. It's hard to figure out. Is the papacy a re reference to Catholicism? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is th this is the time that Catholicism started within their church. You can look really early on. Um, I guess you can see authority in the church after Peter, right? That people are going to try to trace, almost like making a family tree, trace their authority to be God's spokespeople from Peter. Right, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church both do that. That's a big. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big deal. Yeah. The, the authority of being the interpreters, and then you also see in the Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor, and having a um, a pope taking the reins of kind of this hybrid of political power and religious authority in one person. And the the blasphemies, the atrocities of being of being in the place of God to speak for God, but it not being on message, yeah, but it being off message, and that's that's the connection. Then that that we could say, well, look at that, out of Rome, and out of this this and other passages of Scripture to see what is truly anti-Christian and what is happening when you deny the truths of the gospel and Martin Luther and others before them that challenged the teachings of the Catholic Church with purgatory and um, all of the thing, all of the dominoes that are related to that, right? Like the de Medici. Saved by works. All of their yeah. abominations. So that, that gives a lot of clarity for um, what is going on now and the mind that calls for wisdom. So I think when you get to this this beast described with seven heads and then talking about these these different heads, five have fallen, one is, and another has yet to come. So you have a head that exists now, and this is why the numbering here is suggestive. Um, suggestive numbering. I don't I don't know. I feel like you could study these things all day, and um, I I trust the experts. But if you were to go back and think about Egypt and then Assyria, and then Babylon, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, five have fallen, right? And this almost um, sounds like the statue, some of these are identified as the statue in Daniel, right? Where he wants to talk about kingdoms to come, and which one, and what happens to them with horns and stuff like that even. Egypt wanted to do away with the Israelites, right? When things came to a climax and ahead, Pharaoh wanted to wipe them all out and came out with his army, but God delivered them, right? So you see a big threat to the Israelites, but they escaped. Sennacherib comes all the way to the doorstep of Jerusalem that would take over and completely destroy their kingdom. And he loses in the time of the Assyrians. And the Babylonians come and, and they have their captivity, but God makes clear his word that it's not the end of your story. I don't want you to be afraid. You don't join them. Don't fear their gods. Fear me. <laughs> then the Persians come, and you know what happened in the time of Xerxes is the book of Esther, where an edict is given to kill all the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. And then instead, Haman ends up hanged on the own, you know, that's a, what a neat story. Yeah. Haman's hanged on the very gallows that he built for Mordecai, and when the king finds it, and then he reverses the whole order, and it's gone. So they escape in this genocide of the Jewish people. And then you, you also have Antiochus Epiphanes corrupting um, the Jewish faith at the time of Alexander, the, Greek, the Greek Empire um, and threatening their religion then. Um, so 
all of those things are like five kings that have fallen. You know, this beast, these world powers that have been used in the past to try to, or have threatened in the past and failed. Um, five fallen kings is a part of this beast. So you already know that the beast is a loser. Five of his heads have fallen and lost. So you have a, you also have a, um, You also have a parallel in verse 8, don't you, with he once was and now is not and will come up. And it, it's interesting language because God is described to us as him who was and is and is to come. And now he's like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to steal? What kind of glory language almost? It's like the number 666 where it falls short of God in every way. And you kind of have the same sense of like he he once was he now is not and he's going to come so you kind of have this missing out on the glory of god they're going to be astonished so he wants you to know about five fallen kings one that is now in existence the roman empire perhaps and the other that has not yet come that could kind of <laughs> encapsulate the future so we're going to talk about a ruler to come and there's really there's 10 horns there's 10 kings that are involved and it, it could be a reference to 10 being a number of completion to say let me tell you about all the rest let me tell you about all the rest that are coming because now you've seen a cycle and you've learned a pattern and you're like look at that 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 Fallen, 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 Roman Empire, fallen. And guess what the story is going to be for everybody else, right? Uh, I think we get the trend. So we're paying attention. You're, you're trying to teach us, angel, not to be afraid and to know the victory of the lamb as they make war against the lamb and his people. I, I don't know what that war is going to look like. I, I We know what the war is. Um, we don't always know where it's going to end up taking us but i know who wins i know who wins and i'm going to stick to my calling my message and my mission um because i because i know those things that's overarching purpose i'm showing you the punishment first first up is chapter 17 the characters And then you get chapter 18, which is part two, right? The punishment. So think of this as this is a vision related to the seven bowls. This is a vision that's tying it all together for us. Now we're seeing the woman. We're seeing this. This is who they are. This is who they are. This is who they are. And then you're going to see them destroy chapter 18 next week. There are two verses in there that are hopeful and their promises fulfilled. Yeah. Verse 14, the lamb will overcome, and then of course there's 17 ages of stuff. God's word. Yeah. Until God's word is words are fulfilled. Yeah. That's the end time. Yeah. It's always I don't know how to how to picture this, but it's almost like for all the development of a metaphor and a scene out in the desert that you're gonna see, there's always a way where John, by the Spirit, interrupts and says something clear. That the Lamb is going to win. And, and all those is called, is chosen, is faithful followers. And then to say they're accomplishing God's purposes. You like step out of the picture and you just, you get this clear teaching comfort to come out of it. You can't miss the point. It's kind of like what the Spirit wants to say to you. You can't miss this point. Um, the victory of the Lamb and the God who uses all these things for his purposes. One last note, maybe before we go. In verse 16, we can come back to some of these two next week, but verse 16, the beast and the ten horns you saw, they'll hate the prostitute. They'll bring her to ruin and leave her naked. Do you remember we saw that in Ezekiel 16? That unfaithful Israel who had all these alliances? I says, I will give you to your lovers. Remember that language? Mm -hmm. And they will they will strip you bare and they will leave you naked. 
That's why we read it. That's why we read it. We kind of bringing in the languages. There's a picture here that what you think you're getting when you're, if you're going to go along with an apostate church, it looks so great. It looks so glorious. And this is what the church should be doing. Um, it's so attractive. No, nope. it's, it's going to, it's God's, it's alliance is going to come back to hurt it. And it's not helpful. Um, so that's what God said back then to the apostate church. You know, these people are going to come. They're going to plunder you. They're going to take you. They're going to leave you naked. And God says the same thing here at the uh, at that spot in 16. They're going to hate the prostitute, bring her to ruin. So the beast turns on the woman. God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. Until all his words are, are fulfilled. All right. Pause for now. I know that was a lot. Sorry. Oh, was <laughs> Threading good. some things together, right? Yeah. Stitching some things. Overarching. Holding on to the it's big It's like reading picture. poetry. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, connected to promises yeah mm. and for all the unknowns that you still say i walk away well we're not done with this scene but i walk away saying you're trying to tell me something clear about really big impressive things that shouldn't have my heart because they're not going to win no lords the lord is going to win i'm going to walk away with that strength from my day today to be god's person in the world well, God bless you and keep you. And uh, what a great start to the weekend, so to speak. And then Sunday morning, we have confirmation and Easter 5, our fifth Sunday of Easter. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. We're going to sing some new liturgical songs. Are we going to do that new Gloria? I don't know, but Gloria's not really ready on that. Oh, yeah? We'll pull it off. <laughs> You got Anna and Pastor. Gotcha, Anna. Other voices in there that are unique. Yeah, yeah. Well, take a look. We'll take a look. Good stuff. Well, God be with us and blessings on the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you.